class, things often wind up to be on a very fitting day. Um, <laughs> It wasn't deliberate uh, when I wrote this syllabus in July that um, today we would cover um, the cases of Lawrence, Romer, and Windsor. Um, it was not deliberate, but I think it, uh, uh, it is fitting. And we've already had uh, uh, lengthy discussions on this topic, so I want to hit it from a slightly different angle, okay? So for those of you who don't know, um, uh, yesterday, uh, Houston voters, uh, hopefully all of you voted, and if you didn't, uh, uh, you should have, but yesterday, Houston voters, by a margin of 61, 62%, voted to repeal the Houston Equal Rights Ordinance, the HERO. Um, preceding this vote, of course, was a campaign, um, and the campaign um, labeled this ordinance the bathroom ordinance and we discussed this at some length so on its face the ordinance said absolutely nothing about bathrooms it said that uh in various places of public accommodation you could not um, discriminate one of the protected classes was sexual uh, a gender a gender identity that is uh, how a person identifies their gender and that's distinguished from sexual orientation which means who a person is um, uh, uh, sexually attracted to, loosely speaking. So why, why is this salient? Um, this story has made national news. Um, it was on the front page of the New York Times today and was mentioned in various, I, I mean, I was on CNN.com, got a breaking alert. I was watching the poll numbers, but you get breaking alerts everywhere. I think this case teaches a number of lessons I'm going to try and tease out throughout the course of our lesson today. And in large measure, it builds on a point I think Toshiba made last class about whether the courts are pushing or pulling, that is whether the courts are leading or trailing behind. And in light of the Obergefell decision, which you'll have to read for next week, um, today's vote may suggest the court didn't quite perceive where we are or maybe it did. So the three cases you want to review today, Romer v. Evans, Lawrence v. Texas, and uh, United, versus, United States versus Windsor um, represent something of a, a, a trilogy, if you will, uh, as they were called at the time, uh, of gay rights decisions. And the history and backdrop of these cases is, um, uh, almost as important as the cases themselves. Okay, so before I get started, does everyone know that the Supreme Court decided the gay marriage issue in the 1970s? Does everyone know this? You don't know? A case called Baker versus Nelson. Anyone hear about this case? Okay. Well, in, I think I think it was in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. Uh, specified gender. It said two people may apply for a marriage license and they get married. So you had a guy, I can't remember if it was Baker or Nelson, I can't remember which one it was, but you had a guy and another guy. And they walked into a office, I think it was 1972, maybe off by a year, and they requested a marriage license. Out of here, scram. They filed a lawsuit in court. And they challenged that it violated their rights on the Equal Protection Clause. Okay, this was a case called Baker versus Nelson. And the Court of Appeals, uh, or was it the Minnesota Supreme Court, doesn't really matter, ruled against them. So at the time, the Supreme Court had a different practice. So today, they're required to take all cases that come before them. In the 1970s, they didn't have that discretion. They had to actually consider every case. They couldn't just decline if they didn't want to grant certiorari. So there's a practice where the court would say, a substantial federal question in this case. In other words, this case is so easy, we don't even need to resolve this in oral arguments. So the case of Baker v. Nelson was appealed to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, we're going to dismiss it for wants of a substantial federal question. This case is so easy, so easy that the federal constitution does not guarantee a right to gay marriage. We're just going to dismiss this case. Precedent. You brought it up before the Supreme Court being able to push back cases, set things up, and that became. Uh, Congress rejected that. 
Co co I'm sorry, Congress embraced that because historically the court had to take cases. Now they don't. Was there an official decision that went along? It's actually really complicated. I can tell you after class, it's, 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 fairly, it's fairly complicated. But the short answer, the short answer is that now they, they have total discretion. But the point is, in 1972, whatever, 73, it was considered such an easy case that there wasn't a right to gay marriage that, you know, the court, Supreme Court didn't even bother arguing it. Over the subsequent, I guess, 40-something years, though, a lot of things changed in this country. And the court played an essential role in that change. And one of the questions I want you to think about in your head is, where was the court? Was it trailing behind, or was it perhaps beating far ahead? So one case that was mentioned in your reading, but wasn't included in your reading for, for an apparent reason, is a 1986 decision called Bowers versus Hardwick. Bowers against Hardwick, 1986. This was a case involving a Georgia couple who were arrested the cop broke in, and they were engaged in a sex attack. They were convicted for sodomy. They appealed this case to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the court held, very clearly, the Due Process Clause does not confer the right upon homosexuals to engage in sodomy. While the right to privacy protects intimate aspects of marriage, it does not protect sodomy, because, quote, there's no connection between family, marriage, or procreation on the one hand, and homosexual activity on the other. So in effect, the court held that all these rights about privacy, even among married, unmarried couples, has to do with procreation. Sodomy, which, for those of you who don't know, is non-vaginal sex, does not and cannot lead to procreation unless some immaculate conception happens. So that was the rule in 1986. And the Supreme Court held this in a fairly non-controversial non decision. One of the justices in the court at the time uh, was a justice named Lewis Powell. And he famously asked one of his law clerks, you know, I don't even know any gay people, right? I, I, you know, this is so difficult for me to relate to. I don't even know any gay people, right? Turned out the clerk was gay in the closet at the time, but he, he came out some years later. And um, one of the aspects of these cases, perhaps, is the awareness that there are actually gay people, and you may indeed know one of them. But at the time, a justice who had hired a gay clerk had no idea, said, I don't even know any gay people. And then this was a big, uh, it was in the New York Times a couple years ago when the uh, gay marriage cases were being argued. And that brings us to the early 1990s. I need to, I think all of you were alive then. I can't say that for my day students. I think all of you were alive in the early 1990s. <laughs> it's true. One student, I had to find out the exam question about Titanic, you know, the movie. And one said, I was four when the movie came out. I was like, you were watching that when you were four? He's like, well, you know, anyway. Wherever you are, you're far. So in the early 1990s, a movement began not for gay marriage, but what was called civil unions. Okay, what is a civil union? Well, it's some sort of a domestic partnership that bestows some of the financial benefits of marriage, but it isn't called marriage. Um, and some states began to institute them. For example, Hawaii uh, 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 created this sort of civil domestic partnership. And as a result of Hawaii's decision, um, many states began to... Um, mildly uh, a panic and they feared a redefinition of what marriage was one of the first acts which we'll get to later that was enacted nationwide was the federal defense of marriage act doma and doma did a lot of things but the point we'll discuss today is it defined for purposes of federal law that a married couple could only be the opposite sex but it also made clear that states were not obligated to recognize gay marriages from outside of their state. This bill was passed overwhelmingly by Democrats and Republicans. Um, President Clinton signed it. He claims he signed it at midnight with no cameras, but he signed it. 
Um, subsequent to that, President Clinton's came out and said he uh, 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 he doesn't he was not proud of that. He regrets signing it, and he's actually said. I'll get to this in a second. He said the reason why they pushed for DOMA was to prevent a constitutional amendment that will have recognized marriage as the union between one man and one woman, a federal constitutional amendment. That's almost certainly a lie. Uh, uh, people have researched this. They've gone to the archives. They found absolutely no record that anyone ever actually said that at the time. Uh, this, this only came out a couple years later as a rationalization. Um, but President Clinton is now saying he regrets DOMA back to give an award to Edie Windsor, uh, the lead plaintiff in the DOMA case. So there's that. But at the same time as DOMA was being enacted, um, many cities began enacting ordinances that prohibited, I'm sorry, that, that prohibited discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Many cities began saying, okay, if you are a, a gay couple and you're a city employee, you will get uh, benefits. Your, your, your partner, you can't be married, but your domestic partner would be able to share your health insurance policy. Um, Houston apparently was not one of these cities, but um, uh, actually, does anyone know, was anyone here in 1985 in Houston, remember? Mark, Mark remember that? Michelle? Yes. So Houston actually, we've gone through this before already, I actually have to research this, but in 1985, the Houston City Council enacted an ordinance that prohibited discrimination against gays and lesbians, and it was repealed in much the same way that the hero was uh, repealed um, in the vote yesterday. So Houston has been here. But a few of the cities that did this were in Colorado. Uh, uh, you know, very progressive cities. Boulder, um, uh, uh, Denver, Aspen, uh, uh, you know. Um, and they effectively said, you can't discriminate against gays and lesbians. Fine. The people of Colorado didn't like this. And they enacted a constitutional amendment, became known as Amendment Number Two. And what the state amendment basically did was it prohibited local jurisdictions from eliminating discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. No state or subdivision uh, 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 can enact any ordinance to uh, um, uh, make a sexual orientation the basis of some sort of status. You cannot basically single this group out to afford them any sort of status. And this amendment was passed by a wide majority of voters in Colorado, obviously outside of the, the three cities I mentioned. And this case was challenged in state court, not federal court, they went to state court. And this case became known as Romer v. Evans. And I want to dwell on the theory behind the case before I go to the facts. So where did I finish up? Okay, Jared. Jared, if I were just to describe this case to you based on what you've learned so far in terms of due process and equal protection, which provision of the Constitution would you think is offended by, um, uh, by, by, by Amendment 2? What is the liberty interest? What is the right being violated here? Discrimination. Yeah, but the due process says you can't deprive someone of liberty without due process of law. What is the liberty interest at issue here? I guess because they're sectioning out. Uh, you're not answering my question. Okay. What is the liberty interest at issue here? The sexual orientation? Or? Is that a liberty interest? Um, mm -hmm. What do you think? We, oh, my, Roy, my, you're next. You're going this way, this way. Roy, are you, Sheba. Are you, are you, uh, uh, no, no, are you pointing that way? Okay, no, I'll go. Going that way. Okay, Sheba, you're up next. What, what provision of the Constitution, based on everything we studied so far, do you think would be offended by this law? Okay, equal protection. I'm going to get back to that in a second. But there's a very interesting issue with respect to the gay rights cases. The distinction between what's called status and conduct. Status and conduct. Is it discrimination against gays 
based on their status as being homosexual or based on their conduct that is engaging in sex relations with a person of the same, same sex. The court, especially in Windsor, blurs these two. Lawrence as well. They blur the two. Like blurred lines, right? They blur the two. But I think the sheep is right. Well, why do you think equal protection would be the, the more accurate framework to use when looking at this sort of state law? Ah, you're classifying on the basis of sexual orientation. Thank you. Okay. So on the one hand, you could say there's a classification on the basis of sexual orientation. Now, Jennifer, is that a suspect class under the court's precedence? Is sexual orientation a suspect class under the court's precedence? Yeah. So under the court's precedence, right, a classification on the basis of sexual orientation is not suspect. And indeed, lest there be any doubt, not even 10 years earlier in Bowers v. Hardwick, the court upheld the law which basically criminalizes an act of homosexual sodomy. It's criminalized. So, so, so Jennifer, if we're, not, if we're not applying a suspect class, we're not doing strict scrutiny, what kind of scrutiny would we usually consider in these cases? Yeah. So usually, when a classification is based on non-suspect class, rational basis scrutiny applies. And as I've told you more times than I can count, under rational basis, the government wins. It's almost always the case that on a rational basis, the government can win. But this case didn't do that. And it made a number of very important um, uh, doctrinal moves to shift what's going on. So first of all, Caleb, does this law actually single out gays and lesbians for some sort of unfair treatment? According to Justice Kennedy, yes. <coughs> well, you're, you're, you're hedging. Why are you hedging? Um, well, Scalia would disagree with him. Um, well, explain the explain the disagreement, please. So K Kennedy argues that because of the classification and because um, it targets homosexual couples or homosexual individuals, um, it now makes it harder for them to obtain the same um, the same protected interests as every other member of society, mm. based solely on their status as a homosexual. Uh, Kennedy argues that. It only makes it harder for them to seek preferential treatment. Scalia. Opposed, yes, Scalia. Um, as opposed to the same protections as everybody else. Okay. okay. So let's, let's actually break down because this is an important point. If the ordinance had said all people who are gay uh, must pay a tax, must pay a fine every year, I think we would also that law singles out gays and straights. So or if the law had said, all gay people must sit in a different train car. Here's an example we study in different contexts, right? I think everyone would agree that that signals out the gays for a different treatment. But what Amendment 2 does, and this is Scalia's point, is that it simply says they can't be afforded additional protection. And this is something two sides of the same coin, right? Kennedy says... By saying they can't get additional protection, you're singling them, singling them out for unfair treatment. And Scalia says, what are you talking about? You're simply saying they can't be treated differently, right? You can't give them special protection. And then Scalia, uh, Kennedy replies, but other groups can get special protection, like veterans and people who smoke and others. And Scalia says, well, then that's the decision of the state. If they want to do that, they can. But with respect to the gays and lesbians, this is not any sort of specialized treatment. Um, the Scalia view, again, is in the dissent, so... Uh, that doesn't prevail. But this does actually hark to another case we studied about making it harder for certain groups to change laws that protect them. They don't know what case I'm talking about? It's a good review. Yeah. No, not Lochner. Good guess, though. Not Loving. Is that the case in New Orleans with the butchers? No, not Slaughterhouse. 
A law passed that makes it harder for certain groups to modify the law. Good, that's what I'm thinking of. I'll give you a hint. Affirmative action. Shooty. Miss. Shooty, yeah. Remember the Michigan case where the, the, amend, the constitutional amendment to say that we will not afford any affirmative action in any state institutions. And the argument was, by doing that, they've now made it harder for certain minority groups to lobby for change. Because instead of just passing a local ordinance, they're not needing to amend the state constitution to override that. You'll notice, Schutte never cited Romer, which I thought was an interesting insight of how rare this case is. This case, this case has not been cited anywhere else for this proposition. So you have to read Romer as kind of a one-off in its own little Anthony Kennedy world. Right? Yeah. Are you talking about the discrete and so on? No, no, no. Shooty versus uh, uh, by any means necessary. It's a 2013 case. Okay. Um, we, we covered it. When we did Gruder. It's there. But the other argument is now, now by going to a state constitution, people in Colorado, in uh, Denver, and wherever else who want to afford gay rights can't. They've now been penalized, and they can't have that asset to democratic change. Okay. But in any event, you're right. This is an equal protection case, and under rational basis review. The state, the state wins, right? Um, let's see, Kevin, what what is the state's interest to justify this classification? We'll assume it's a classification. Well, let's assume that's what you're talking about. What is the state's interest in justifying this classification? <clears throat> why why did the state enact this law? Or, or sorry, this amendment, saying law. No, no. Why did the people of Colorado enact the amendment that basically nullified these state laws or these city laws? Because they. What was their rationale? What was the state interest there? You're thinking way too hard. Why didn't the voters of Colorado voted for this amendment? They didn't believe in gay marriage. This is nothing with marriage. Oh, we're, we're, we're 20 years off from marriage. What did the amendment do? It, uh, it stopped uh, other laws from giving them extra protection. Good. OK. Why do you think the voters of Colorado enacted this constitutional amendment? They didn't want special privileges given to them. Why? Can you tell me what they did? I'm asking for the why. Brian, take a step. Uh, morality. Morality. Oh, my. Yes. Morality. What, what do you mean? What do you mean, Brian, morality? What do you mean? Uh, <laughs> So, morality, right? The idea was that historically homosexual, homosexual is viewed as sinful. Going back to Sodom and Gomorrah, people viewed gay relations as sinful. And the state said, we do not want to promote this lifestyle. We do not want to promote this, 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 this manner of being. We do not want to afford any special protections to it. We don't incentivize it. We don't necessarily want to stigmatize it, but we just don't want to give it any special protection. This issue of whether morality affords the state a basis to classify gays and lesbians is the defining issue in Windsor, Lawrence, and Obergefell, right? Does the state's interest in promoting morality? This is not a separation of church and state issue, right? This is not about a specific religion. Does the state's interest in promoting morality include the power to treat certain people perhaps differently because of who they are or what it is they do? You will recall that when we did Roe and Eisenstadt and Griswold, remember how they said, oh, but you can still ban 
fornication, right? You can still ban sodomy. You can still ban adultery. You can still criminalize this and that. You just can't ban contraceptives. Even the courts in the 70s, which were very, very strong on protecting individual rights, said the state still had an interest in regulating morality. What started in Romer and really ended in Windsor, and Obergefell is a foregone conclusion, was the Supreme Court's determination that morality no longer works. Moral disapproval is no longer a rational basis to enact the law. Merely looking at someone as acting immorally, the court said, and Justice Kennedy wrote all of them, so it's really Justice Kennedy. We're in this world, we're just, we're just following. It was Justice Kennedy who determined that these sorts of decisions do not fly. Kill. Kennedy overturned Bowers and Lawrence. Right, but didn't he take that idea that morality does it is no longer controlling? Yeah. Like controlling interest. I mean, yeah, Stevens didn't make it up, but they did use that line. But you're right. All right. So Kennedy, though, also makes another few points. So how does he reconcile this with rational basis review? Justice Kennedy explains that this law is based on animus. Nuri, what, what does he talk about animus? What does this mean? What's this, what's this bare animus to harm? He uses the expression over and over again. The bare animus to harm. But what are you talking about there? Um, I think it's that the, the law enacted is to, the amendment is to the detriment of disability. Yeah. Uh, oh. Of the homosexual community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, it gives examples of two types of uh, laws <clears throat> that are repealed because of this, uh, as well as other English ones. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Kennedy basically says that this law imposes a disability on a specific class. And why was his disability imposed? He says based on an animosity, which if you get a dictionary, animus means some sort of hatred or a severe dislike. And he quotes a decision called USDA v. Moreno, U.S. Department of Agriculture versus Moreno. 1970-something. It's a Brennan decision. Remember I said Brennan always sneaks these sentences into cases that get cited all these years later? This, this sentence by Brennan has been cited in every single Kennedy gay rights decision. This is a fulcrum of Anthony Kennedy's existence. And um, the sentence is this. If the constitutional conception of equal protection of the laws means anything, it must at the very least mean that a bare desire to harm a politically unpopular group cannot constitute a legitimate governmental interest. A bare desire to harm a politically unpopular group cannot constitute a legitimate governmental interest. Brennan put that sentence in, it didn't matter, it had nothing to do with the case, right? It was irrelevant. But this has been cited in every single gay rights decision. And Justice Kennedy determines that Amendment 2 is nothing more than a bare desire to harm gays and lesbians. Simply disapproving of their moral choices ain't going to cut it. Sorry. When they were, since this law was amended or created because as a reaction to the ordinances passed by the cities, uh, when the cities pass these ordinances, you would assume that there's, they have a good reason for, or some reason, whether it's good or bad, they have a reason for it. Now by even proposing an amendment, take away uh, the protection provided. I mean, to say that, oh, it, it, they're just being privileged, that they're only getting, that they want to be uh, special and that they have more rights than a regular person, I think is uh, is looking at the law wrong. That, oh, so. Because the, the background of this in the, from the 80s, I mean, homosexuality has been targeted. It, and I'm, I mean, uh, not old enough to know, but I'd imagine that before the the purpose of these laws and these type of laws being passed was so that they can they could get equal homes and they could add a, they could have the equal standard in job and workplace. And I know uh, you stated the Georgia case on sodomy, uh, but they differentiate that in that the Georgia law, uh, 
major crime for all sodomy across the board, not just homosexual sodomy. So um, I don't know. I, I, I think many of us agree with the court. So I'm going to put this out there. And uh, with respect to Hero, it's something that's been in my mind recently, right? Let's see, super duper extra credit. <laughs> Anyone see how last night's vote in a row remains or sect? Oh. How last night's vote and Rome may intersect. And what happened after? Michelle? We, no. we, 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 we actually just talked about this before, so it's somewhat, somewhat cheating, but yeah, go for it. <laughs> I brought it up to you. Yeah. Um, the Kennedy painted people, all that would vote against it, as one group being hate, haters. Haters gonna hate, and hate, hate. I have to tell you, it, it blew me away. I saw it last night on ABC Channel 13, bloggers there, and someone didn't do their homework. They thought I had a progressive person, leaker and a conservative, which turned out to be both progressive thinkers. And they both came out and said, this was a vote by, hate, by haters, by evil people. And it just blew me away. I thought, well, then how do we ever now come together and try to figure out a solution to this? It just completely isolated, I think, any kind of first or debate now that occur. I haven't figured back into that. You also mentioned the uh, strong possibility of a couple of classes of hope of uh, the Supreme Court coming back in eight to 10 years and overruling this when it comes to all people, regardless of what the state has enacted. So in that way, we parallel this. Yeah. I think we obviously have to be like conscious of, of the abuse of the majority, but um, I think Scalia makes somewhat of a valid point that you know th this is being passed in a in a democratic way. I mean, this goes to a referendum; the entire city votes on it, right? And I mean, well, I mean, this in this case, like we the, the city voted on it in the case of Hero. In the case of Amendment Two, right, that's the state voting on it, not. Not the individual cities, but the entire state. So it seems like that's a more democratic voice, you know, uh, than. Well, one at a time. One at a time. What was that? So um, I want to leap off this for a bit and, and build on it. So one of the points that Chief Justice Roberts wrote in his dissent in Windsor is that. The court should be very hesitant to paint people with the quote brush of bigotry. The brush of bigotry. And I think in large measure the vote yesterday in Houston will force a recalibration in the strategy. Calling people haters and bigots will do very little to change minds. And uh, Notwithstanding Mayor Parker's comments last night, which you can watch on YouTube, they're already there, um, the national media has actually been very quiet today about this because I think they recognize even in a city like Houston, the way that minds are changed is over time. And let me just, just give a little bit of background. When the Supreme Court ultimately got to a Burger Hall, 2015, by that point, over 12 states had already legalized gay marriage, and many others were headed in that direction. I want to show you um, um, this chart. When I first started teaching, we didn't even have Windsor. Um, and this was a chart published in 2000, it was 12 or 13, I can't remember what it was. And it tried to project trends of when there will be support for gay marriage in various states. And already by 2008, I'm sorry, by 2012, Roughly half the state team were over 50%. And the answer was about 2016, which basically now, right? Almost 50, uh, almost every state except for these red ones at the bottom will be over 50%. By 2020, okay, by 2020, virtually every state except for, even Texas will be at 52%. Virtually every state will be at 50%, okay? This graph is irrelevant because of a burger full, right? The Supreme Court made the decision for us. But the point I want to stress is that by the time a burger full got to the Supreme Court, gay marriage became a more or less 50-50 issue. So she wouldn't maybe get any of the exact numbers. Uh, but it, it was... 
Yes. I can't be corrected. No, I'm, I'm kidding. If anyone has. But by the time a burger fold is decided nationwide, Gay America is more or less a 50-50 issue. Now, that's still a 50-50 issue, right? But the issue with the hero ordinance wasn't just about gay marriage, but also involved gender identity. Um, that's not a 50-50 issue. And I think the discussion in this class, which we had you know, very passionately, and this, I'm assuming this class perhaps doesn't match my politics, which is fine, but even in this class, people express a discomfort with the bathroom thing, the shower thing. Until hearts and minds are changed upon that, and the, until people recognize that there's a stigma attached to people who have to go to a bathroom that they don't identify with, until people understand that, the primary concern would be, well, I don't want to be uncomfortable, and I don't want to explain to my daughter why there's a penis in the bathroom, right? The thing about the predators, I, you know, that, that, that's whatever. That, but the, there's, there's a concern which people in this room expressed about this. And I think there should be a very careful decision not to simply label anyone who voted yes or, or voted no yesterday um, as a bigot and a hater because they're perhaps expressing heartfelt concerns. Now, to your point, is our moral disapproval of how people act, is our disapproval of a man being in the ladies' locker room, right? Is that a, is that a rational state interest after a burger fall? I think the answer is no. And I'm going to tell you where this actually matters. So not just in the constitutional sphere, but in the statutory sphere. Um, public schools are governed by something called Title IX. So you probably know this in, the, in terms of sports, right? There has to be equal funding for men and, and women athletics. But it also says in all their aspects, education must be equal. The issue, I think, Adrian, did you put a comment on my blog last night or am I tripping? I thought you did, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, so the, an issue that's been percolating has to do with public schools. And there's actually a school, I think it was in Illinois, was it? There's a school in Illinois where basically you had a transgender student who, who, who wanted to use a, 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 the girl's bathroom. Um, anatomically, the person was still a, a, a male, okay? The school said, listen, we'll let you use a single stall, but we won't let you into the girl's locker room to play sports and whatever else. And the girl sued. Um, and the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education basically is filing a brief on her behalf, saying that the Title IX prohibition on using gender, I'm sorry, the Title IX prohibition against gender discrimination embraces gender identity issues. So a statute written about 40 years ago, which prohibits uh, discrimination based on gender, which is really meant for sports, now includes the ability to say uh, 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 you can use whatever bathroom you identify with. Um, this is going to courts now. Um, unlike the gay marriage issue, if the vote in Houston's any indication, Houston's a pretty liberal city. I mean, as far as I mean, as far as it, it's pretty liberal. If the vote in Houston was sixty thirty eight or whatever it was, um, the courts may not be there yet to actually find that Title IX includes transgender discrimination. But the EEOC and Title IX have taken this position. Um, one of the other issues with the gay marriage cases was how hard gay advocates worked to keep the marriage issue out of the courts until they were ready. Um, the court didn't get to 2015. Prop 8 was passed in California in 2008. People were mad at the lawyers in the Prop 8 case for even challenging them. Listen, let's just let California go. We'll revisit this later. We don't want to lose this case. Um, so, in terms of what role the court plays in this change, um, I think various communities are saying, okay, we need to think of a plan B, and the bigotry brush one isn't going to cut it, because I talked to several people today who watched the mayor last night, and they were incensed at her comments, and you can watch them um, later. So I'm going to shut up now. That's my little spiel that I want to get at some point today, but I think that's more or less where we stand today. Okay, Steve, you're, you've been waiting patiently. Yeah, I've done a lot of I, 
I, I, I don't know what you're saying. So just say that one more time, but the fundamental right. Okay. Okay. Isn't that what they did in Lawrence? Okay. Isn't that what the court did in Lawrence? I'm assuming you read it, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I mean, isn't that roughly what the court did in Lawrence? Kind of. Scalia. Mm. Mm. They bleed together, yeah. So let, let's let's go. I think you make a fair point. So let's go into Scalia's dissent in um in Romer. So his first sentence is one of his, of his, of his I mean, he has he's a good writer. I, I I putting aside what he writes, his writing. He often says he writes his dissents for the law school case books. He makes point very clear. He wants people to know will disagree with Justice Kennedy. That's why he writes these. And his first sentence. The court has mistaken a culture kampf for a fit of spite. You know what a culture kampf is? Yeah, cultural struggle. Anyone know, like mind kampf, my struggle? Funny, I actually had a student from Germany she sat right there last year. I said, finally, what's culture kampf? She's like, uh, I don't know. It was like, well, what's like mind kampf? She's like, we weren't allowed to read that. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> By the way, I, 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 don't, I don't want to dwell on this quickly, or for, just for a moment, but um, there's a video floating around YouTube uh, by a guy named James O'Keefe who does these kind of sting operations. It's like, whatever. But one of, the ask, one of the sting operations is they actually go to a college administrator and the student says, I find the Constitution very offensive. And the student, who's actually an actor, tells the administrator, can we shred the Constitution? And you actually see them putting pieces of the Cato Constitution into a shredder shredding it and uh broke my heart speaking of banning books anyway so scalia begins the court has mistaken a culture comp for a spit of fight the constitutional amendment before us is not the manifestation of a bare desire to harm homosexuals but a modest attempt by seemingly tolerant coloradans to preserve traditional sexual mores against the efforts of a politically powerful minority politically powerful minority to revise those mores through use of the laws. That objective and the means chosen to achieve it are not unimpeachable. They have been approved by the Congress and by this court. So Scalia is basically saying is that this is not an effort to single out gays and lesbians. This is an effort by the people of Colorado to preserve their traditional morals and not place the imprimatur on relations that they perhaps deem sinful. Scalia goes on to say, what about Bowers, right? How can it possibly be that the state can throw a couple in jail for having gay sex, but they can't say that gays get no special treatment? How could that possibly be right? And Scalia writes, I vigorously dissent. So I noted that usually they write, I respectfully dissent. And when they're pissed off, they write just, I dissent. Drop the mic, right? Here, it's I vigorously dissent. Um, uh, Scalia was, was, was livid here, and as, as we said before, Scalia says this poses no special treatment, um, and this is basically uh, 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 ridiculous. Now, towards the end, Scalia makes this point about polygamy, and he's really talking about gay marriage here, right? He sees the writing on the, law, on the wall, right? If you can no longer use morality as a basis to decide to treat gays different from straight people. How in the world do you justify 
marriage limited to one man and one woman. How can you do it, Scalia is basically saying. How do you get rid of polygamy? Many states in their constitution say you cannot have polygamy. It was actually a condition of admission to the union. If love is love, why two, why not three? By the way, there's actually a lawsuit now by the, you know the Sister Wives, someone watch that show? I've never seen it, but it's a show about, they're not actually polygamists because they're not married, but they're these people who hold themselves out to be married to, to, to a couple different women. Um, and, and they're challenging in court because Utah even prohibits holding yourself out as married even if you don't have a marriage license, which is, I guess, would land Hugh Hefner in some hot water. So what do we make doctrinal, right? Was this rational basis? Um, at the time, people said this was rational basis plus or rational basis with bite, um, uh, uh, different words to describe it. But this, this wasn't any as it was historically known. But this was the first salvo in the um, decision uh, of, of, uh, of the gay rights trilogy. Now it's, I guess, a quartet. I don't know what you want to call it, but this was the first one. So any questions on Romer or on Hero? The issue of, of Hero and Romer, I'm, I'm probably going to write something about this because I, I mentioned this to one student before, so she knows I'm not making it up. I think there's going to be litigation about this. I, I'm pretty sure that someone's going to, have they already sued? Did I, okay. No, no. no I'm pretty sure someone's going to, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I, to, I told Michelle this in office hours a week or two ago, but I'm pretty sure there's going to be litigation over this. And I'm pretty sure they're going to say that the repeal of Hero is tantamount to the Amendment 2 in Romer. I don't think the argument works for reasons I'm going to develop in my own time, but I'm fairly certain that this is not going to be taken down, uh, taken lightly. Um, litigation, I think, will be a mistake because, again, to the extent public opinion supported gay marriage, public opinion is not there. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I don't really think that's okay. Hero. From what I understand, Hero was not, not gay. But no, it wasn't. Yeah. I think people are having. Yeah. I don't think it was like that. Oh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> it goes, it comes up a bit more. Um, yeah, actually, I, I, as I was reading through this, I thought so, you know, um, in uh, the end of the second point, it was actually pointing directly to the, the hero uh, issue. Yeah. Uh, when he says that the central thesis of the court's reasoning that any group is denied equal protection when to obtain advantage. Or avoid disadvantage, it must have recourse to a more general and hence more difficult level of government. But he goes on to talk about how the different levels of government, which I think is exactly what we had here, where yep. the legislation was passed through the democratic process, yep. taken to the courts, and yep. then sent it back to referendum yep. by the people. And so I think he's kind of speaking directly to that issue. Yep. Um, yep, that's why I think there may be litigation. I, I don't. I, I don't know if there will be, but I'm probably going to write something about this because I've been thinking about this for a few weeks. Like even before we, I I, I knew this was coming, and I was thinking about it. Yeah, Mark, your hand was up, and then Lee. Yeah. Well, I got. I think, I think one. Sure. I think the, the hero deal. I think it's more of a political kind of warfare kind of deal. Was it a culture comp? Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's culture comp. Well, you had just basically one group get their message out while another group just kind of stay just latent about it and not necessarily get into to great detail about what the ordinance is really about as opposed to just the bathroom deal. No one on the, on the fore side of it, in my opinion, ever really came out and, and just, hey, here's what the ordinance means. Here's the, because it, it kind of drilled down to two words, public accommodation, you know, and, and what is public accommodation in the sense of them being able, does that mean that they have the ability to go into a, a, a restroom or a so I think that if if they would have got down and, and, and kind of focused on that particular issue, do you know how much money was fundraised for Yes on One? Uh, about three million dollars was raised to support Hero, and about a million dollars was raised to oppose it. Fair enough. So, but but this is actually a fair point. So Justice Scalia says, "Oh, what was that quote?" Um, a, a uh, politically, I want to get the exact quote. Yeah. He says, 
it was a politically powerful minority, right? Well, yeah, basically, and, and this, this became known as the, 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 the homosexual lobby, it's referred to in a different opinion, right? But he says that this was a politically powerful minority. Um, and, and this does raise the point of whether, in fact, gays and lesbians are discreet and insular. Right? Discreet, perhaps, in number, insular, in impact. Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, this case also turns footnote four of Carolina Products on its head because mere small numbers doesn't necessarily mean mere political powerlessness. Um, and there were plenty of ads on both sides. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't watch much TV at all, but there, there, there was lots of money on both sides. Actually, I'll tell you about this next week, but Mr. Bergafel was here in Houston. None of you went. I, I was there. Uh, and I'll tell you about it in class on Monday. I was, I was hoping somebody would show up and none of you were. It was, it was during class time, so in fairness, you couldn't have been there. Anyone else? Oh, Lee, I think your hand was up before. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. So that's not gonna happen. So the only thing I care about Super Bowl is getting out of town. I hope they cancel class. This is gonna be a nightmare because of the they're doing something with the convention center across the street. Stay away. So don't come to class today. It's gonna be a nightmare. It's gonna be a police state. They're gonna be checkpoints every five feet. You're not gonna be able to park your car. I really hope they cancel class, but it's not my decision. No, we, we've, been, we've been talking about this. It's going to be a nightmare when the Super Bowl comes here. Just get out of town. All right, last comment. They'll go on to Lawrence. Actually, I don't have a comment or question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so if you don't mind helping me here, um, can you tell me, is Kennedy completely not touching classification or scrutiny? doesn't matter. Justice Kennedy doesn't care about scrutiny. He does not care about scrutiny. If you read his vision in Romer, Lawrence, Windsor, and then a Burgerful, the word scrutiny does not appear, or if he mentions it, it's perfunctory. He does not care about accuser scrutiny. He doesn't even care about equal protection due process. It's about liberty. It's about dignity. Justice Kennedy does not, he's not bound by text. He's not bound by tears. It doesn't matter. He is an island unto himself, and we're just along for the ride. Um, I, I don't say that lightly, but I've actually read an entire like, long article how Kennedy does not care about scrutiny. It doesn't matter at all. Uh, at all. This is why I don't make a list. I'll get to that. Can this is why I don't bother teaching about scrutiny anymore? It's like it doesn't matter because Kennedy. Yeah, what's with morality is not a rational basis, right? Morality is not. He didn't quite say that. He makes it clearer in Lawrence and then Windsor. So let's move on to Lawrence again. Well, we're back right here in Houston. Um, the facts of this case are actually. Um, very sordid, and I don't say this lightly. Um, so this is this is Tyrone Garner, and this is John Lawrence, who were the the uh, uh, the defendants. As you should have plain us, but here they were the defendants in this case. So the usual story, and this is a story that they mention in the in the facts of the case, is that uh, four sheriff deputies from Harris County got a report of someone with a weapon. They entered the apartment, no warrant, and they found Garner and Lawrence engaging in some sort of sex act, right? Uh, they said that Lawrence was aggressive and that the officer arrested him and then he was charged with sodomy. Yeah, do you know the charge? Yes, yeah, homosexual sodomy. Thank, Thank you. Oh, you got insight, yeah. That didn't happen, not even close. So Garner and Lawrence, uh, uh, Garner said, we didn't have sex. <laughs> so this part's actually very bizarre. There were four officers who barged into the apartment, okay? Two of them did not note any sexual encounter, okay? One of them observed, observed anal sex. Anal sex. The other, the other observed oral sex. Oral sex. 
this, I do this after the birth control kids. There's a difference in appearance between two people engaging in oral sex and anal sex. Daryl, as a former police officer, would you agree that's a, that's a fair observation? Yeah, you must have to work at the circus or something. All <laughs> oh, I wasn't going there. Lee, oh, no, no. What? Oh, good. Well, I was going to say, uh, he's got my back on this. That's a really bad choice of words. Anyway, so the, so it's not even clear. They may have just been cuddling, which is probably what was happening. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not. Try, I'm not. I'm not. I don't know. Anyway, they were arrested. They were charged. What happens next, though, is very bizarre. So at the time, this was a Class C. I mean, it was a pretty small offense. And yeah, ticket. And they pleaded no contest, and they were awarded a fine. This part also is unclear because trial courts don't really keep records. But apparently the lawyer for Mr. Lawrence demanded that the judge increase the fine so it would be high enough to appeal. Isn't that for the small enough fine you can't really appeal it? Isn't that how it works? You said what, a fine I can't remember. Yeah, whatever it was, if the fine was a small amount, you could not even appeal it. But basically the, the lawyers said we want a higher fine. Imagine that. Why? Because they wanted to take the, ca the, the case. So... In the same sense that Norman McCorvey didn't really sign up to be a civil rights icon, um, Mr. Lawrence um, didn't either. He actually died a couple of years ago, two, three years ago. Um, he didn't really, you know, want this. But at the time, uh, they weren't really in a relationship either. Um, as it turns out, and this part, again, is speculative, the person who made the police report was, Lawrence, was Garner's boyfriend. And apparently, Garner was fooling around with Lawrence. Garner was fooling around with Lawrence, and then Garner's boyfriend called him a false police report. Yeah, this was not the story of love that, that Justice Kennedy paints. I mean, there, there's, there's some hanky-panky going on, but whatever, right? But also, by making this a case, they both added themselves at the closet. And that was also a pretty big deal, right? Now they became national gay symbols. And in 2000 one or two whenever this happened, that wasn't quite the same thing as it is today. So Justice Kennedy begins the opinion. So you'll recall in Casey, the, the opinion began, liberty finds no refuge in a jurisprudence of doubt. Here we have even worse. Liberty protects the person from unwarranted government intrusion into a dwelling or other private places. In our tradition, the state is not omnipresent in the home, and there are other spheres of our lives and existence outside the, home, outside the home where the state should not be a dominant presence. My favorite. Freedom extends beyond spatial bounds. Liberty presumes an autonomy of self that includes freedom of thought, belief, expression, and certain intimate conduct. The instant case involves liberty of the person, both in its spatial and its more transcendent dimensions. Yvette, remember that one? Who said that? Who said first? The Pope. He actually got this from Pope John Paul II. And Yvette emailed me. Very, very, very good email. Right? She, she, uh, she. This language about the. Uh, Person in spatial and transcendent dimensions comes from the Pope. Go, go freaking figure. You know, it's an opinion about sodomy. You quote the Pope. I, I got, he has no shame, none, none at all. So we have the facts, which again, aren't quite what they seem. And one aspect that Daryl maybe speak to, this statue was never enforced. Uh, you had to actually see it. It was very difficult to enforce. Yeah, yeah for the reason that usually you don't see people engaging in sexual acts. But the Harris County DA, a guy named Chuck Rosenthal, remember him? Not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Okay. Uh, decided that he wanted to make this his case to make him famous. He said, we're going to prosecute this case all the way to the Supreme Court. This case should have never gone anywhere. These statutes were never enforced. Virtually all states were repealing them. 
But some idiot Harris County DA, sorry, Mr. Rosenthal <laughs> decided to prosecute this case all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, here's some other pictures of Lawrence and uh, Garner um, uh, along the way. Let's see, there they are. Okay. Yeah, and again, they were not in a relationship, but they they made nice for the case so that they would be together. Uh, whatever, whatever floats your boat, right? Yeah, and again, the, the facts are basically that apparently Lawrence invited Garner to help him move some furniture or something. It was, the facts are weird, right? <laughs> anyway, there's a good book called, uh, what's it called, Flagrant Conduct by Dale Carpenter, professor at Minnesota, who actually interviewed the two of them, and he actually uh, wrote about the details of the case. So it's called Flagrant Conduct, which was the charge at the time. So, uh, oh, where the hell was I up to? I can't remember. Nina, I think you're next, right? I didn't hurry. Oh, okay, I can go to Andrew, fine. Right, whatever you want. I'll come back, don't worry. Andrew, so if I told you there was a case where, where an individual was basically sent to, uh, or was fined for engaging in, um, in a sex act, what <clears throat> provision of the Constitution do you think would be implicated? What clause of the Constitution is implicated here? If, if something prosecuted for engaging in a sex act. Equal protection laws. Why protection? Because uh, everybody uh, should be able to be. Uh, now, I think Nuri mentioned before, but does this law criminalize heterosexual sodomy? In other words, if a man and a woman engage in anal sex, under this statute, would they, would they be prosecuted? No, okay, so the statute on its face only applied to people the same sex engaging in certain sexual acts. That's actually what it was called homosexual conduct was the offense. Was there another statute for heterosexual conduct? No, it says a uh, person commits an offense to be engaged in deviant sexual intercourse with another individual of the same sex. Mm -hmm. offense, right. So, uh, so, so I think I think Andrew raises a fair point. Right. The easiest way to resolve this would be equal protection. Who? Which justice made this an equal protection decision? Iris, you got it? Taylor? Who, which, which of the opinions in the case made this an equal protection? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, not clear. Iris, you got it? O'Connor. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, look at me, I'm Sandra D, right? Sandra O'Connor, Sandra O'Connor concurred. I Iris said correctly. She said this is an equal protection violation, right? It's a classification on the basis of gender. We already had this intermediate scrutiny deal, right? So if you treat men and women differently, you you, you question whether they have a, a valid basis. Now, now, Iris, let me ask you the harder question. Why do you think the majority opinion didn't come out and say this is an equal protection case. Why didn't Justice Kennedy didn't come out and say this is a form of discrimination against gays and lesbians based on the basis of sex? Think. This is only 2003. What happens if five justices say that you can't discriminate between gays and lesbians? What comes next? Yeah, what kind of lawsuits? What are they challenging? Um, no, Taylor? Uh, marriage. marriage. So what's lurking in the background of Lawrence <clears throat> is a recognition that once you say the state does not have a basis to treat gays and lesbians differently, on what basis can you justify institutional marriage? I'm sorry, traditional marriage. On what basis can you? So perhaps the question of Michelle, why does Justice Kennedy not talk about scrutiny? Well, because when you talk about scrutiny, it actually sets precedence for other things. If you just have this wishy-washy garbage, it makes no precedent. But even in a burger full, you didn't go that far. So we'll pause here. But yes, so Justice O'Connor raises a point that Andrew said, well, you have equal protection, right? A man and a woman can engage in anal sex, but two men cannot. Okay. 
But were they actually to say there's an equal protection, that would mean that they're a suspect class. Therefore, strict scrutiny applies. Bye-bye institutional of, uh, traditional marriage. Gone. Justice Kennedy, I'm sorry, Justice O'Connor, tries to say, oh, but, but you know, this doesn't apply to, to marriage, right? <clears throat> Does anyone believe that? Scalia's like, yeah, I don't, I don't believe that for a second. And he's right. Once you explain that there's no rational reason to treat gays and lesbians differently than straight couples, there's no reason to have a ban on gay marriage. There's none at all. And we'll discuss this in much more depth last week. So rather than go down the route of equal protection, uh, uh, Bridget, what clause does the majority opinion then rely on? The due process clause. So, Bridget, what is the liberty interest in this case? Um, unwanted government intrusions into your house and your private. Be more, be more precise. It's okay. You can say it. it's a dirty I word. Yeah, I want to be more. What is Who the? Are you having sex with, or how you're having sex? Sodomy. Or, as Justice Kane says, love. <laughs> love. It's unclear if they actually loved each other. So it was just a fling. Whatever. It doesn't matter. But, you know, love, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing about the moving the furniture is just, it's whatever. Love. The sweet mysteries of life, right? So Justice Kennedy basically says that you have a fundamental liberty interest in love. It's not the raw act of sex, right? The penetration, that's not the liberty interest. It's about intimacy, relations between people, right? The emphasis is on the relation, the protected spaces between people. And he bases this on Roe, on Griswold, on Eisenstadt, and on Casey. People have a, a right to determine their own sexual intimacy and intercourse. Adults can choose relations in private. Okay, This is a sentence. When sexuality finds overt expression in intimate conduct with another person, the conduct can be but one element in a personal bond that is more enduring. He does not write good greeting cards, but apparently he writes Supreme Court decisions. I don't know what that means, right? Adults may choose to enter upon this relationship in the confines of their home and their own private lives and shall retain their dignity as free persons. Okay? So he basically defines this liberty interest at a very high level. Now, we discuss one aspect of due process is whether a right is fundamental. If a due process right is fundamental, then strict scrutiny applies. Michelle, not perfect timing. Does Justice Kennedy call the right to sodomy, the love, or whatever else fundamental? No. He does not. Why not? Why do you think he doesn't? Well, if he does that, then again, like you said, we get into gay marriage. Yeah. Gay marriage, and he wanted to avoid it. He just wanted to say that the court just wanted to say there's no state interest based on moral judgment to interfere with this liberty. Good. So again, there are all these debates. Is Lawrence strict scrutiny a rational basis? Well, if it's not a fundamental right, then it's rational basis. Not that scrutiny matters to Kennedy, but if we're under rational basis, we ask, does a state have any sort of legitimate state interest to regulate this interest? So, Tam, what is Texas's, you know, what is Texas's interest in criminalizing sodomy among uh, uh, homosexuals or I guess they're going to be lesbian sodomy, but, you know, among people of the same sex. What is the state's interest here? The state. Why did the state of Texas enact this law? What was their, what was their state interest? They wanted to protect the traditional, you know, like, to promote the deviated sexual conduct. <laughs> Yeah, they're trying to promote traditional sexual mores and prohibit deviant, to use the word of the statute, prohibit deviant sex. But Tam, what, why, why does Texas want to do those things? Why does the legislature in Austin want to promote traditional mores 
and 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 discourage deviant sexual activity. Morality. Morality. Moral disapproval. It boils down to one sentence. Texans disapproved of homosexual sex. There's no other way of explaining it. That the legislature said we disapprove of this sexual act, hence we will cr criminalize it. That's it. In the same sense that they say we disapprove of prostitution, we'll criminalize it. We disapprove of bigamy, we'll criminalize it. We disapprove of uh, fornication, extramarital sex, we'll criminalize it. And they did. Now, Justice Kennedy makes the point of saying that even though the state may have been doing, done this historically, these laws are getting repealed. Daryl, what, what does he say about how these laws are somewhat not quite as effective as they once were? I'm sorry? That's okay. He's, he's basically, he doesn't really in our morals. We can't really base our laws on morals. So yes. No, that's an answer I'm looking for. Nina, that's it. It's in the case. So, Nina, what does Justice Kenny think about how these laws have been enforced the last half century? What do you say about this? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, build on that, please. They were, they were not historically um, enforced good. against um, homosexual. Good, 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 good. So what Kennedy said is the idea of, of singling out gays and lesbians for this treatment is fairly new. There's not a deeply rooted tradition doing this. There have, there have been laws about sodomy, but they weren't targeted at gays. Um, in, in slight fairness, I don't think they would have needed to target the gays because that was not considered a status they even spoke openly of. So. And that entire argument is a shibboleth. It doesn't really matter. But he basically says, even so, the laws and the books have not been enforced. And this is the argument that the court, you know, kind of trailing behind, leading ahead. They said, well, these laws aren't really being enforced, so no one would really be harmed if it's overturned. And indeed, uh, okay, Nina, uh, go um, to, to, to Tim. This case was 2003. What did the court say about precedent? Not even 12 years earlier in Casey. The entire discussion of precedent. What do they say about precedent, Casey? Liberty finds a refuge in a jurisprudence of doubt. 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 Yeah. doubt. Yeah. What was the holding? Why did the court in Casey not overturn Ralph? Oh, they um, they just got rid of the uh, trimester. No, 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 no. Why did the court in Casey not want to overturn Roe? Because it was president. Why? Why? Why was that precedent not to be overturned? No, 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 Michael. Yeah. Okay. So Scalia raises this point, right? Bowers, nineteen eighty-six. Lawrence, 2013, not even 17 years elapsed, and the overturning Bowers. Michael, was the overturning of Bowers consistent in Justice Kennedy's mind with Casey not overturning Roe? How does Kennedy explain that they would not overturn Roe but they overturn Bowers? No, 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 go back to another time. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Yeah, uh, I think he was saying that Bowers was decaying. I mean, basically, the, the popular opinion of what was going on was decaying since the, they ruled on Bowers. So he effectively says that people have not been relying on Bowers. Roe. 
people relied on. Oh, she's not here. But as Jennifer gasped at last week, apparently women structure their entire lives that they can have an abortion at some point. Right? She's not here, right? So I can I can I can say it on her behalf. But Kennedy says that Bowers people have not relied on. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh God, you're paying attention. Good. Yes. Justice Kennedy's usual meme is that he's fine overturning precedents when it expands liberty. But if it were to contract liberty, he's for stare decisis. Uh, that one way ratchet, right? If it if it go if it if it goes in the in the in the way that people in, you know, you know, Austria like and the, the enlightened people, right? It's fine. But if it's a way that, you know, Kennedy disagrees with he deems it beneath himself, it's not. But I want to actually push back on Kennedy's point. Is it the case that the rule of Bowers had not been relied on. So it's absolutely true that there had not been prosecutions for sodomy. There, there just hadn't been any. But Bowers stood for more than just a case about sodomy. It stood for the proposition that the state has an interest in regulating based on moral conduct. Bowers was a recognition that morality was a legitimate basis for state action. So Kennedy's taking a very myopic view of Bowers. It's true, right? There have not been sodomy prosecutions. But the aspect of Bowers that have been relied upon in enacting perhaps DOMA and enacting various state bans on gay marriage was that morality afforded a rational basis on which a state could act. So Kennedy's entire discussion of stare decisis, uh, it, 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 it boggles the mind, and Kennedy, I'm sorry, Scalia rips him to shreds in the dissent. But on this narrow point, it simply isn't true that Bauer had not been relied upon. In fact, many states which prohibited gay marriage were acting on that very basis. So perhaps there's a difference between criminalizing an act versus not bestowing a recognition for it. This moves into the next case a little bit more. Okay. Um, in any event, Kennedy writes, Bowers has been criticized. We've had Romer. We've had Casey, which he wrote both of. It's funny when he talks about Romer and Casey. It's basically him, right? He's basically citing himself as present for doing what he's about to do. It, it, it's remarkable to imagine how, how much impact one human being has had on the world. Uh, far more than anything President Obama could have ever done. Kennedy's, we're living in his world. Uh, we're just watching. So now we get to the point, is this equal protection? Is it due process? Well, you know, it's both equality of treatment and the due process rights that demand respect are linked in important respects, he says. So again, he doesn't really care about scrutiny. He hasn't called this a fundamental right. He doesn't say strict scrutiny applies. Um, this is all In any event, the court overturns Bowers v. Hardwick. Star decisis does not control. And by the way, this doesn't apply to marriage. So he says at the very end of his opinion, it does not involve whether the government must give formal recognition to any relationship that homosexual persons seek to enter. It does not involve whether the government must give formal recognition to any relationships the homosexual person seeks to enter. Um, no one believed this at the time. Anyone reading this in 2003 didn't believe this, um, but Kennedy wrote it, you know, to perhaps save his own skin. And then in the second to last paragraph, he says, the Texas statute furthers no legitimate state interest which can justify an intrusion into the personal and private life of the individual. In other words, concerns for morality are no longer legitimate state interests. Even under a rational basis review, morality will not suffice. We cannot make rules based on moral notions. Western civilization had it wrong. So, any questions on the majority opinion by Kennedy? It's very um, diaphanous in its prose, but um, it left a lot of people struggling because after Lawrence, I mean, th I think this was, this was my comma final exam question. So when I took on, like, what's the scrutiny after Lawrence? And, you know, now we know it doesn't really matter anymore. Okay. Again, we discussed O'Connor. O'Connor would make an equal protection question, but of course, that doesn't get you to marriage. She just ducks it, but um, you know, it doesn't doesn't really doesn't really distinguish it. 
Okay. <clears throat> Scalia's dissent. The first sentence of Scalia's dissent. Liberty finds no refuge <laughs> in a jurisprudence of doubt. That was the court's sententious response barely more than a decade ago to those who were seeking to over overrule Roe. The court's response today to those who have engaged in a 17-year crusade to overrule Bowers is very different. The need for stability and certainty presents no barrier. So basically, Scalia is recognizing this one-way ratchet when it's a right that people like, go for it, overturn precedent. Otherwise, you got to keep on the books, no matter how wrong it may be. Scalia says, scrutiny is only mentioned briefly in the second to last paragraph, but most of the rest of the opinion has no relevance to its actual holding. There are discussions on fundamental propositions and fundamental decisions, but no discussion on fundamental rights. It doesn't, have strict, it doesn't apply strict scrutiny, yet it effectively does in name. Okay. Scalia writes, the court simply describes their conduct as an exercise of liberty, which undoubtedly is, and applies a, quote, unheard of form of rational basis review that will have far-reaching applications beyond this case. And the purpose of Scalia's dissent was really to sound the alarm and basically saying, you guys weren't listening to me in Romer. I told you what was going to happen, and now it's happening. In fact, if you read the trilogy, or how many cases, from Casey to Romer to Lawrence to Windsor to Obergefell, right? Casey, Romer, Lawrence, Windsor, Obergefell. Kennedy and Scalia are playing this cat and mouse game, right? Where, you know, Scalia is nipping at his heels and he keeps just running away. It, it, it's fascinating when you read all those cases in a row, which I've painfully done. Um, but there's a there's a definite like trend going on. Scalia writes state laws against bigamy, same sex marriage, adult incest, prostitution, masturbation, adultery, fornication, bestiality, and obscenity are likewise sustainable only in light of Bauer's validations of laws based on moral choices. In other words. Once you get rid of Bauer, you're not just getting rid of a, of, a, of a sodomy case. You're getting rid of a case that stood for the proposition that morality afforded a rational basis to govern. Once that's gone, bigamy, same-sex marriage, adult incest, prostitution, masturbation. There, was that illegal? I hope not. <laughs> Fornication, bestiality, and insanity are likewise sustainable. Right. God. <laughs> Sorry, I'm picking on him today. He didn't do his reading. Yeah. So... Scalia says you can't do any of these things anymore. They're all unsustainable. Every single one of these laws is called into question by today's decision. The court makes no effort to cabin the scope of its decision to exclude them from its holding. The impossibility of distinguishing homosexuality from other traditional moral offenses is precisely why Bowers rejected the rational basis defense. The law, it said, is constantly based on notions of morality. And if all laws representing essentially moral choices are to be invalidated under the due process clause, the courts will be very busy indeed. Okay, Overruling Bowers, he says, will have a massive disruption of our social order. And, um, well, he was, probably, he was probably right to some degree. Because if you look forward to Windsor, which we'll read in a few minutes, the court makes clear that a moral disapproval of gay relations is not a rational basis. So DOMA must be unconstitutional. So, yes, sir. Can the Supreme Court just uh, now understand the, what they've opened the door to here? Can the Supreme Court now go with the rule they have and take the cases, just not take the cases that they know is blatantly obvious that they have a moral issue? Can you just put those off to them off? Who's going to force them to take those cases? Well, I told you there's a prosecution involving bigamy. Not even a week after the court ruled in a burger fall, was it Montana or Wyoming? Some state out one of those box states, right? Someone, oops, someone walked in to the clerk's office and said, I'd like to marry these two women, and they denied her a license. Okay, she sued. How do you do that? 
Um, one of my most unintentionally popular, popular blog posts ever, and I'll explain why in a second, was whether the state had an interest in criminalizing gay, gay incest. So the title was, two, Could Two Brothers Be Prosecuted for Sleeping with Each Other? with a different adjective, right? And the reason why is, why does the state have an interest in banning incest? Well, the reasoning is perhaps there is a risk of disease through congenital diseases. Well, that, that's not really a good reason why. If I marry someone with a, with a recessive gene, both carry recessive genes, our kid is guaranteed to have a recessive disease, we can still get married and have sex. So the entire notion that you have to criminalize incest when it's consensual, when you can have a DNA test is a much more narrowly tailored means. Anyway, but two men cannot reproduce. There's no chance of them passing on congenital defects. How can the state criminalize consensual adult incest? And this is actually not crazy. This actually happens surprisingly often. Twins separated at birth fall in love. Twins separated at birth later in life. Google this. I'm serious. Twins separated later in life fall in love. This happened. It was in Germany or the UK, somewhere in Europe, where there these twins. They were separated at birth, and they later found each other and fell in love, and they want to get married. What's the state of interest song that they can't? You think the bathroom bills was a big one? Wait till we get to the incest cases. I'm serious. Like, you think <laughs> this is coming? This, I, this, perhaps Kenny's opinion in these words open the door. I mean, you can't avoid these. And if these people apply for licenses, maybe the Supreme Court could just refuse the cases, but it's, it's coming down the pike. I grossed you out, didn't I? Okay. <laughs> you had no idea what you're getting when you signed up for this class, did you? No idea. Um, Scalia then talks about, oh yeah, Marco, please break, break up my flow. You need four votes to review a case. And this part is actually probably a little bit of trolling. But Justice Scalia will vote to grant that case because he wants to put mud in Kennedy's face. Right? The four <laughs> observable dissenters want to take the incest case. Like, all right, Kennedy, put your money where your mouth is. Oh, oh bad choice of words. Wow. Uh, <laughs> but no, but I actually consider this. The four observable dissenters will take the bigamy case just to screw. So they will take the, the, the incest case just to screw Kennedy. Uh, I, I don't have much doubt. Okay. So Scalia goes on to talk about liberty. He says, you know, lots of things are liberty, right? Prostitution is liberty. Using heroin is liberty. Working 60 hours in a bakery. Lochner is liberty. And the mere fact that there's liberty doesn't mean you can do it, right? There actually has to be some sort of a right that's fundamental, and the court doesn't even bother going there. And as, as someone said, uh, basically they adopt the Stevens uh, dissent in Bowers, which says morality is no longer a valid basis. Uh, yeah. So Scalia closes with a, with a passage that many people find perhaps patronizing or offensive, but he says, let me be clear. I have nothing against homosexuals or any other group promoting their agenda to normal democratic means. Social perceptions of morality and sexuality change over time, and every group has the right to persuade its fellow citizens that its views in such matter is the best. That homosexuals have achieved some success in that state, in that enterprise, is attested by the fact that Texas is one of the few remaining states that criminalize private consensual homosexual acts. But persuading one's fellow citizens is one thing, and imposing one's views in absence of democratic majority will is something else. Um, Scalia says, let this be done by the people. Don't do this ourselves. We have no business doing this. Um, he calls this, the, the promise about no gay marriage, a bald, unreasoned disclaimer. Okay. Then he goes on to another point. How can you now exclude marriage? between men and women, you can't. What justification is there to deny the benefits of homosexual marriage to couples if this is in fact a liberty protected by the Constitution? Surely not procreation, Scalia writes, because the elderly and the sterile can marry. If it's not based on moral disapproval, it's not based on anything. Any question that Scalia said? Oh, by the way, there's a little discussion of studying international law, which I don't want to focus on much, but Scalia seemed, I'm sorry, Kennedy seems to suggest that what's going on overseas in Europe should inform our own understanding of American constitutional law, and that's a very 
controversial premise which Scalia rejects wholeheartedly. Is there a hand somewhere? Oh, yeah, one, two, yeah, go. Uh, with Scalia bringing up the, uh, the gay marriage, is it some way he's kind of yanking the clock out of Kim Jong Un that they're setting up? The so in Scalia's dissent in Windsor, where he basically says this opens the door to gay marriage, almost every judge who ruled there's a right to gay marriage cited Scalia's dissent saying, told you so. Every district court judge who found there's a right to gay marriage cites Scalia's dissent saying, told you so. Look, Scalia said it. There's no, there's no, there's no basis to distinguish. You gotta give him marriage licenses. I'm sure Scalia was amused. Yeah. What? Hey. Appropriate for what? So, so, so Scalia is interesting, right? So one area where he's very, very active is in the area of criminal rights. So did you guys say the confrontation clause in criminal procedure? This is the idea that you have to be able to confront the witness to accuse, right? And for many years, the court basically ignored that clause of the Constitution. They allowed, um, so to use an example, right? Say, say there's a, um, say you're in a criminal trial and evidence has been introduced against you and there's forensic evidence and, the, and some forensic doctor um, uh, uh, performed a, a, an examination of the evidence, whatever it is, a sample. Under, under, for many years, the police could actually send in a different analyst who didn't perform the report, but who can speak to what was done in the report. Scalia's decision in a number of cases said, no, no, no. The person who performed the report must be there because you have to confront your accuser. So actually one of Scalia's, he always says his proudest case is actually in the confrontation clause case. He's very active on this. Um, in terms of other individual rights, he wrote District of Columbia v. Heller, the Second Amendment decision. Um, and that, again, is perhaps anti-democratic uh, because the people of D.C. wanted um, uh, wanted this law. Uh, but he's very cranky on the due process clause. He calls um, substantive due process babble, argle bargle, in the other opinion. He's in our burger, he calls it jiggery pokery and pure applesauce. Uh, he has beautiful, beautiful, beautiful adjectives. Yeah, there's actually there's actually an entire list of Scalia. It's like it's like argle, bargle, jiggery, pokery, applesauce. It's a you know say that ten times fast. Thank you. He gets increasingly cranky with each opinion. Burgerful. A burger. He, he's almost resigned saying like screw it. You know, but like I lost. And say in a burger, he pulled back a little bit. So Justice Thomas dissented. He said. You know, if this, if I was a member of the Texas legislature, I would vote to repeal this law. It's not a good use of resources. It's, quote, uncommonly silly, but I am not empowered to help uh, these people uh, decide these cases. There's nothing in the Constitution about this. I, uh, I dissent. The liberty of the person in its spatial and more transcendent dimensions, that is Argo Bargle, Justice Thomas. Okay. Any questions on Lawrence? Anything on Lawrence? No? Wow. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the last case in this trilogy, United States versus Windsor. So I mentioned earlier in class the law enacted uh, by President Clinton called the Defense of Marriage Act. And DOMA, DOMA as it was called, did a number of things, um, one of which was it said for purposes of federal law, Marriage will be defined as a relation between one man and one woman. Okay. Why did they do that? Because before DOMA, DOMA looked to state law to define marriage. So, you know, if a different states have different rules. So, for example, in some states you get married at 17, and some states married at 18, some were 16 with parental consent. Uh, in some states, first cousins can't marry, in some states, second cousins can't marry. But for all intents and purposes, under federal law, marriage was defined by however the state defined it. But once you start acting states differently, there was a fear that if you're married in one state, the federal government would have to recognize it, and then under the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution, all other states would have to recognize it. So DOMA did a lot of things, but it effectively amended almost every aspect of the U.S. Code. And whenever the word spouse or wife or husband was used, it said this is only based on one man and one woman. All right? That was Section 3. Um, a different section of DOMA, which wasn't an issue, basically said, if one state recognizes gay marriage, your state doesn't have to. 
Because usually judgments and records in one state are binding in other states. Like if you get married in Texas and you move to Oklahoma, Oklahoma will recognize your marriage under the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution. The court said in, uh, I'm sorry, the Congress said in, in DOMA, they don't have to. But the section at issue in Windsor was the definition for purposes of federal law. And the facts of this case are actually, are actually uh, uh, warming and sad at the same time. Um, so Edie Windsor, and Edie, she's got to be in her 80s at this point. She's, she's really old, um, but, but she's very, 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 very vivacious, very, 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 very full of life. <laughs> and Windsor uh, and, a, and a woman named Thea Spire, they were in New York. They met in 1963 when being gay wasn't a thing you would ever acknowledge. But in 1963, they met, and they were in a long-term relationship for almost five decades. Um, they went to Canada in 2007 to get married. It was legalized in Canada. Um, uh, Spire died in 2009, and she left her entire estate to Windsor. And then for those of you who've taken tax, you know about the estate tax exemption, right? That if your spouse dies, you basically get a serious tax benefit from this. Because they were not married, the tax bill was huge. In fact, Thire, Aspire was really wealthy. Windsor had to pay a tax bill of $363,000. The tax bill, it was a, it was a several, several million dollar estate. Okay? So the case began like this. Windsor sued for a tax refund. Because she said, I was the wife of Spire, and therefore I should get the tax exemption. But wait a minute, under federal law, DOMA said you weren't, because it's based on federal law, not the law of the state. This was the basis of the case. And the posture of the case is actually very messy. The district court ruled that DOMA was unconstitutional and ordered the United States to, to refund the money. Okay. But before the district court ruled, President Obama and Attorney General Holder announced that they would no longer defend the constitutionality of DOMA. I want to dwell on this point for a minute. The president has a duty to take care of the laws of faithfully executed. Historically, if a president determines that a law is unconstitutional, he will not enforce it. And to give you an example, the Israeli passport case, right? He didn't enforce the law because it was unconstitutional. After Windsor's case was filed, the president decided, I don't think that Windsor is constitutional. I think it violates equal protection. So if the president thought that DOMA was unconstitutional, what should he have done to Mrs. Windsor? Anyone guess? If the president thought DOMA was unconstitutional, what, what should he have done to Windsor? And other similarly situated people. Come on. No. What did Windsor want out of this case? Refund. Refund. So if the president actually determined that this law is unconstitutional, he would have stopped enforcing it and sent Windsor a tax refund. But he didn't do that. He took a position which I don't understand. At the same time arguing that it was unconstitutional, he continued to enforce it. At the same time that he argued that the statute was unconstitutional, he refused to give Windsor a refund. Now, this is the inside baseball. Why did he not give Windsor the refund? It would moot the case. The second she gets a refund, she has no claim. Like Abigail Fisher, she got her tuition deposit, right? Application refund, the case is done. This is where law and politics go real close. I'll, I'll get to you in a second. The president did not want to refund the money because that gets rid of the case. He wanted the Supreme Court to invalidate DOMA. Rather than working for legislative repeal, recall Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. Rather than working for legislative repeal, the president wanted this case to go to the Supreme Court. So then something funky happens, right? What happens when the government is not defending a law? Who goes to court to defend it? Oh, Anzal, ask your question. I mean, doesn't that, by definition, then make it not Ah, yes. So, so, so there's no, again, so I'll give my opinion, I'll give the facts, I'll give my opinion in a second. So what happened was, under, under the congressional law, if the president refuses to defend a statute, right, and actually, if you recall, um, in INSP Chata, 
the, the, the president refused to defend the one house veto. The President Reagan thought that was unconstitutional. There's something called the BLAG. BLAG, B L A G, the House Bipartisan Legal Advisory Group, which is usually a member of, of three members of the majority party and two members of the minority party. And they can actually vote to hire a lawyer to defend a statute enacted by Congress. Now, my opinion, this is unconstitutional. <laughs> There's no standing. Congress has no standing to defend statutes. They don't. They don't. And in fact, in Justice Scalia's dissent, he says, There's no standing here. There's no actual case or controversy. To make this even, I'll get to Mark in a second, makes it even more messed up. Even though the president wasn't defending the statute, he still appealed it to the Supreme Court. Even though President Obama wasn't defending DOMA, he still filed a petition for certiorari so it would be before the Supreme Court, and he argued to the Supreme Court that the law was unconstitutional. He was the party to his interest won, yet he appealed anyway. The court ruled that the lower court ruled that DOMA was unconstitutional, yet he appealed it anyway. You know, that's what he wanted to get the case to the Supreme Court. This case is all sorts of effed up. And I, I don't say about this about the merits, but procedurally, this case was a train wreck. A train wreck. This should have never gone to Supreme Court. There was no standing. There was no injury. Right? Again, law and politics in this case. And by the way, the president's decision to come out against DOMA was around the same time when the president was evolving on the issue of gay marriage. We, we, we forget that not even three years ago, our president uh, opposed gay marriage, but then we don't, we don't talk about those, those dark times. Everything's, everything's hunky-dory now. So procedurally, the case was a mess. And in fact, the other case, Hollingsworth versus Perry, which is not a sign, that was a challenge of eight. You may recall that in 2008, the voters of California voted to eliminate gay marriage. It was created by a judicial decision, and the voters of California said no. Ultimately, that decision was, was set aside by the lower court, but the problem there was much the same. Governor Schwarzenegger, the governor, right? He didn't want to defend the judgment. So who appealed? Various county clerks and various state officials appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said that they had no standing to defend the law of the state. So there's a serious problem, which you're going to see a lot more in your life, where executives are going to stop defending laws. Executives will stop enforcing laws they dislike. This is illegal, and I think it's unconstitutional. But you're going to see this non-enforcement become a much bigger much bigger deal as gridlock continues to metastasize. Yeah. It's one of the sanctuary cities? Um, So, so the sanctuary city is actually interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll mention it briefly. So you remember Prince of the United States? In Prince, the Supreme Court held that the federal government cannot commandeer or force local law enforcement to do stuff. So the federal government cannot mandate that local police departments comply with immigration orders. They can't. However, if there's a court order that state officials have to comply with, and a number of cities, New York and others, have suggested that even if there's a court order telling them to release an, an immigrant who's here illegally, they won't comply. That's coming up too, around the bend. Wait, wait for that. But the sanctuary city is actually a murky issue. But Governor Abbott, as a state governor, can do it. The feds can't. So if Governor Abbott wants to withhold funds from a sheriff who doesn't enforce the federal immigration laws, he can do that. Yeah, the, the state power of the purse is, is unlimited. So let's actually go to the, I didn't mean to go, Marco, did I call on you? I forgot. The IRS could have done it on its own accord. If, if the president, in fact, determined that DOMA was unconstitutional, then he would not be bound by it. The same way he determined that the Israeli passport law is unconstitutional, he wasn't bound by it. Presidents sometimes don't follow laws that are unconstitutional. But here, he was basically saying it was unconstitutional, and he was not enforcing it. Or he was enforcing it at the same time, which is, again, this case was really bizarre. So the actual resolution of Windsor, um, you need to think of this as a pit stop to a burger hall. I couldn't say that until last year, but now I can. This was a, a pit stop to a burger hall. 
And we see a couple shades of Kennedy, right? So on the one hand, oh God, what the heck was I up to? I think, I think, I think uh, Pam, I'm up to you. Pam, was this an equal protection case or a due process case? Which, which clause of the Constitution did Justice Kennedy find that DOMA conflicted with? Good. You should be confused. I was when I read it. Yeah. So this is the case where I finally realized Kenny has no idea what he's doing. He doesn't like the constitutional text. It matters nothing to him, right? He effectively says this is actually both due process and equal protection. That both this is treating people unfairly and depriving of a liberty interest. It's both. The phrase he uses is dignity, which is nowhere to be found in the Constitution, but it's a phrase that will appear in a burger in, in, in spades. Okay? This is a law that denies people their dignity. It imposes an injury. And because it denies them this sort of dignity interest, and because morality is no longer a legitimate basis on which to rule, this law cannot stand. He explains this law is motivated by animus. This law is motivated by animus. The valid purpose and practical effect of the law here in question is to impose a disadvantage, a separate status, and so a stigma upon all who enter into same-sex marriages. In other words, this is trying to treat those who enter into gay marriages unfairly and to deprive them of their relationship. Indeed, the statute itself says it expresses both, quote, moral disapproval of homosexuality and a moral conviction that heterosexuality better comports with traditional morality. In other words, this law was passed based on the premise that heterosexuals were better mor morally than gays. As a result, Kennedy writes, this treats gays and lesbians as a second class status. It writes inequality to the US tax code. It makes them unequal. It makes them unworthy of federal regulation. It humiliates their children and their lives are burdened in a visible and public way. And then we finally get to the sort of holding. He says, the liberty protected by the due process clause contains within it the prohibition against denying any person the equal protection of the laws. So is this due process, is equal protection? Shruggy mode, doesn't really matter, right? It really doesn't matter to Kennedy. The government cannot, quote, degrade or demean in the way this law does. It singles them out. Okay. This is basically Lawrence and, and Romer combined. Yes, Chiba. Why is it the Fifth Amendment? Exactly. And remember we discussed in um, uh, uh, Bowling v. Sharp how the equal protection element of the Fifth Amendment is reverse incorporated. Yeah. So, Lee, what's the last sentence of Windsor? Very last sentence. Very, yeah, the majority opinion. Very last sentence. Right before the chief's dissent starts. What does that mean? Ah, right, yeah. What in the last sentence, very Brennan of him, what does that mean? Yeah, what about Texas? Yeah, this is basically his last hope saying, we're only talking about states that have legalized marriage. In fact, there was a big discussion of federalism throughout that, you know, this is all about respect for states' rights. This is all about respect for states who want to confer this dignity on people. Um, pardon the sarcasm, but give me a break, because uh, Obergefell came two years later, 
um, and, and the states had absolutely no authority there. But, you know, does anyone believe this? Um, actually, I wrote in my notes in 2013, does anybody believe this charade? And I wrote in my notes in 2015, don't believe it. So this was obvious at the time they were trying to say we're not talking about gay marriage. No one believed it. This was a pit stop to a burger. Yeah. I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say, he does a really good job of discouraging <laughs> this is a New York law that was passed by the legislature. Legislature New York. Mm -hmm. So, in other cases, he's kind of said, well, for the Homer case, he was going saying, hey, this is a, maybe a majority view that the state was wrong in enacting our legislation. And he doesn't want to mention it seems that the state passed this law. He only likes democracy when it serves his purposes. Yeah, exactly. This is what Sophia alluded to before, right? <laughs> He only likes democracy when it serves his purposes. Uh, it's they're, they're, I mean, even the Schuette decision, right, the affirmative action case, he doesn't like affirmative action, so he's fine if they want to repeal affirmative action. But if you have a Democratic vote, which is why i personally predicting if Hero ever goes for Justice Kennedy, Justice Kennedy will find that this is uh, animus. Imagine Justice Kennedy and Chambers watching the, uh, the, prop, the Prop 1 videos with the bathroom. Can you imagine him watching? He's like, whoa. Can't have this animus against transgender people. You can see this playing out in the next six years. And if I'm right, send me an email, say thank you, Josh. But um, you know, I can see this playing out very, very clearly. Mark, is your hand up? Are you stretching? So the chief let's go through the dissents in our remaining time. And uh, I may go a little bit over today because there's a packed class. We need to go. You're welcome to leave at 7:30. I'm probably gonna go a couple minutes over, which I don't like doing, but today it's fitting. I'm sorry? I have a thought on the dissent. Go for I it. To, I don't want to sound like the same record I would sound like you know, class before. Yeah, go for it, Oswald. But when, when uh, one of the dissents says that this case is about power in several respects, mm. it's about the power of our people to govern themselves and the power of this court to enact the law. Mm -hmm. That's back to the same concept. It's who, who decides, right, what is marriage, what is a spouse, what is whatever. Does the court do it? Mm -hmm. Or do the people, do the duly elected representatives decide? It's, it's, I agree, it's about power. Yeah, so so last night Mayor Parker made a couple comments and she said something that's been often repeated but saying that uh, something like, votes should not be subject, I'm sorry, rights should be subject to a vote. I think that was her quote. Rights should not be subject to a vote. And, you know, to your point, who gets to decide what rights are? So, with respect to the 14th Amendment, if it applies to race, then yes, people can't vote on racial rights. But if the 14th Amendment doesn't protect sexual orientation, which the court didn't actually say, well, then hero repeal does nothing because there's no underlying right to it in the first place. So the Chief Justice's dissent says, first of all, the court lacks jurisdiction, and he's exactly right. There's no reason why this case comes up. This law was passed by 340 members of Congress, 85 senators, and President Clinton. Everyone supported this law. To say that this codifies malice and furthers no legitimate interests tars hundreds of millions of Americans with a brush of bigotry. This is a point we alluded to earlier. That to simply say that anyone opposes hero is transphobic or anyone opposes DOMA is homophobic, um, the chief says, is a bridge too far and unlikely to actually make people um, get together. Um, Robert says a court goes out of its way to make sure there's nothing to do with marriage, but you know, don't don't believe it. Okay, Scalia, and this is Anzalo's point a minute ago. Scalia dissenting in my notes or dissenting bitterly. Here he's bitter. In Obergefell he's resigned, and here he he's bitter. And I'll read you said a second ago. This case is about power in several respects. It is about the power of our people to govern themselves and the power of the court to pronounce the law. Today's opinion aggrandizes the latter with a predictable consequence of diminishing the former. We have no power to decide this case, and even if we did, we have no power under the Constitution to invalidate this adopted legislation. The court's errors on both points spring from the same disease root. Oh, he, he can write. An exalted conception of the role of this institution in America that of the courts. Um, on substance, though, Scalia makes a number of points that are exactly right. Is this equal protection? Is this due process? Is it both? We don't know. 
But again, if it was equal protection, that means that there's no rational basis to exclude gays from marriage. And the court skirts that issue, I forgot to say that, the court skirts that issue quite well. What is the test? What is the scrutiny? We don't know. But the most important part is it makes clear moral disapproval is not a rational basis. So any law based on morality cannot stand. Um, Scalia also makes a point that's actually fairly good. Is there a legitimate reason for this law? Well, yeah, imagine this, right? Imagine that a couple gets married in New York, a same-sex couple, and they move to Alabama, and they file their federal tax return. They file as married or single. Well, under DOMA, it's easy. They file as single because they're not married. But if DOMA is not in place, it would create a very confusing scenario where some people file as married or single depending where they live. It creates a lot of problems with federal tax. Is this a big issue? Not really. But is this a rational, non-animus reason for this law? Absolutely. Are there like bureaucratic reasons why you would want a single definition for marriage nationwide? Sure. But if we're applying this to a heightened scrutiny, these reasons do not um, uh, do not fly. Scalia writes this. I promise you this. The only thing that will confine the court's holding is its sense of what it can get away with. In my opinion, the view that this court will take of the state prohibition of same-sex marriage is beyond mistaken, right? There's no doubt the court will rule for gay marriage. And in fact, almost every judge who ruled in favor of gay marriage cited Scalia's sentence. See, Scalia told us it was okay. He calls this legalistic argo bargle, which is a, a great, um, a great turn of phrase. I also agree with his conclusion that the court has cheated both sides. Oh, I was going to get to that. You beat me, but the key closes like this: the court has cheated both sides, robbing the winners of an honest victory and the losers of the peace that comes from a fair defeat. We owe both them better. And I go back to this chart, this chart which shows by 2016 or 2020 popular opinion. I feel like I'm back to the future. We have an alternate history, right? <laughs> the space time can even forked. We don't know how this will go because the Supreme Court based totally one. If you don't accept gay marriage, you're a bigot. We don't know how public opinion will change. It may remain where it is, and people will kind of soldier where they are. Okay. What did you say, bigot? You said they were enemies of the human race. Oh, hostile humanist <laughs> jurists. Yeah, yeah. If you remember Pearson v. Post, that was actually how, how Justice uh, uh, described the fox as the enemy of the human race. Basically, just pirates. That's how pirates are described in, common, in international law. Um, and Justice Alito has a discussion on traditional marriage. Like People are leaving, so I don't need to go too much. All right. Questions about Windsor? One minute left. Make sure you read a Burgafold. It will be the culmination of this entire exercise. It will be worth your while. Thank you all so much. Have a great weekend, and I will see you soon. Thank you. Next Wednesday. I think it's Galea, man.